It's my pleasure to welcome Javier Fernandez de Babadilla of the Institute for, of Mathematical Sciences in Madrid and the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, who will talk to us today about the generalized Nash problem for smooth germs and the singularities adjacency problem. Okay, so th thank you very much for the, for the invitation. So it's, it's my first time in, at this institute and the first time in Boston. So it's very nice to be here. So, uh, okay, so um, my idea is to make a very, is to make a long introduction and then to, to give, give details of a couple of proofs in a, in a joint paper I just have written with uh, myself, uh, uh, Maria Pepereira and Patrick Popescu. Oh. Okay. So let me let me tell what is the original formulation of Nash problem and one of its generalizations. And um, okay, so Nash problem is the following. Uh, so I, I will call, only consider the surface case. Take a normal surface singularity. Take a minimal resolution. And consider one set. Which is EI. Irreducible component of the exceptional device. Of the minimal resolution of singularity. So you have E is pi minus one of zero, which is the singular point, and this decomposes, I think, the irreducible component decomposition. So on the other hand, I can consider the arc space, the arc space. So what is the arc space of the singularity? is the set of parametrizations uh -huh. and uh, I only ask this to be a formal power series. So if you want to be completely precise, here you should write a spectrum of C. So you may consider this set, and this set has a natural structure of an algebraic variety in a, in a very simple way. So this set projects to the set Xn, which is the set uh, of a scheme morphism from a spectrum of And this is obviously an algebraic variety because to describe such a, such a mapping, you only have to de see, describe the coordinates. So you have a, a finite set of a truncated power series. You truncate the power series up to t equal m plus 1. And now you plug the power series into the equations of g. You develop, and then you find polynomial equations in the, in the power series. So it's not necessary that you know these details because they, will, don't, they won't appear in the rest of the talk and I don't want to, to lose time making the details. But this is a scheme. And then Nash took the irreducible decomposition and he proved using the resolution of singularities that this decomposes infinitely many uh, irreducible components, okay? So you take the set of irreducible components of the arc space, and now you are going to define a mapping, which is the Nash map, 
and you define it as follows. You take a component, take an arc, gamma j belonging to xj, so you take it in a generic way. So you picture it here. You consider a lifting of the arc to the resolution, and when the arc you pick is generic, then it lifts transversely. certain irreducible component of the exceptional divisor. So this is the lifting of the arc of the resolution. And this is the divisor that Nash mapping picks for this irreducible component of the arc space. And you can check that if you take any other generic arc, it picks the same component. Okay? And I'll say, uh, so the question of Nash was whether this mapping is uh, well, it's easy to prove that this mapping is uh, injective, and Nash asked whether the mapping is surjective or not. Or not. So, so this, we prove this. Mm -hmm. Maria Pepereira and me prove this that uh, is surjective. Okay. So in the in the course of understanding or in the in the in the years that happened since Nash formulated the problem and the solution came, the uh, some generalization of Nash question was proposed. And let me tell you what is the generalized Nash problem. So in order to understand the gener generalized Nash problem, it's useful to understand why Nash realized that the uh, arc space has only finitely many irreducible components. Okay? So let's define a subset of the arc space. So pick EI, an irreducible component of the exceptional divisor. And now define N E I to be so you take the arcs gamma that belong to the arc space of the singularity, but such that the lifting of gamma, so if you take the lifting of gamma and evaluate at zero, this belongs to the divisor E I. So you take this set, and now you take the Sarisky closure in the arc space. So it's the set of arcs that whose lifting, so it's the closure of the set of arcs whose lifting meets EI. But it is very important to write closure here. And now let me argue that one of these sets is an irreducible set. And in the proof is very simple. So this is the Sarisky NEI, is the Sarisky closure of this set. So let me denote NEI dot to the same set, but removing the Sarisky closure. Okay, so these are really the arcs that lift through EI. And this set has a mapping to EI, so if you choose an arc, then you take the lifting of the arc to the resolution, and you evaluate at zero, and this picks a point in EI, okay? So this uh, has a natural scheme structure, this is open, Sarisky open subset in some scheme, and this is a scheme morphism. So I'm not checking this. This is an scheme morphism. And this guy is irreducible. So let's look what is the fiber of this morphism. So the fibers of this morphism are the set of arcs whose lifting 
go through a single point. So I can identify the fiber of the morphism with a set of arcs through this smooth germ. But the set of arcs at a smooth germ is, uh, is irreducible because you impose no conditions. So this is a morphism um, which is irreducible base and irreducible fiber. So this means that N the I is irreducible. But then, this implies that the Sadisky closure is irreducible as well. Okay. And this is essentially Nash proof that the irreducible components of the arc space uh, are finite. So just make a resolution of singularities. And you notice that any arc going through the origin has to lift through any point. So it has to belong to one of these components. So you prove that the arc space is the union. So if you take any resolution of singularities, uh, the union of the NEIs. Okay. And now Nash problem can be translated uh, in the following way. So reformulation of Nash problem. So if n, okay, so before reformulating, you will understand easier the reformulation. Now you have this decomposition. So you, you have this, this expression of x as a union. So it's not necessary that this union is uh, irredundant. So it could be that uh, it, it could be that some of the some of the sets are not are not necessary. You can leave out one some of the indices and still get uh, uh, um, the whole x. Okay, and um, yeah, and then last question. So if you, if you look at Nash mapping, so if you know that uh, xj is n e i of j, then the image of xj under Nash mapping is exactly e i j. Okay? So this is pretty obvious from the definition because uh, now picking up a generic point a generic arc in xj is picking an arc here. So that you view it down, and when you lift it, it picks the component ei. Another reformulation of Nash problem is that if ni, if nei, and if ei and ej are irreducible components, of the minimal resolution, then N E I uh, is never contained in N E J. Okay. Yeah. So this is completely equivalent to Nash problem because this means that uh, this decomposition is irredundant, and then each of the elements here is really the image of one irreducible component of the exceptional device. So uh, Nash question can be generalized as follows. Okay, so let x0 be a normal. So it can be generalized to any dimension, but let me speak about surfaces. Normal surface singularity. Let um, study. All 
entertainment relations and e and f where e and f are divisors over uh, the divisors of x over the edge. So you can identify E with its divisorial valuation. Okay. So the generalized Nash problem consists you give two divisorial valuation uh, centered at the at the singular uh, point of a surface. So uh, give conditions, these necessary and sufficient conditions so that uh, the uh, set of arcs related to one of the evaluation is uh, containing the set of arcs of the other one. Okay. Yeah, so this is a generalized answer. And it was posed, as far as I know, by Ishi. And I, I think by Ein also, but I'm not completely sure who was first or whether Ein did it. But as far as I can learn from the literature, is, this is the case. OK. Um, so this means that solving Nash problem is just making a little step in solving generalized Nash problem because there are many, many divisors. Okay. So that problem is uh, much harder. And uh, so it is open even for x0 is zero comma zero. So uh, it's open even for the smooth term. And I am concentrating in this case. So from now on, x equals 0. So and now my aim is to try to understand this problem. OK. What would be a solution? study of the framework. Try to understand this poset. Yeah. Describe the poset. <coughs> this uh, giving a description. Oh, oh, yeah, if you give a divisor, I think it will become pretty clear. Um, yeah, so I can anticipate. Yeah, two ideals, for example, can you relate the two ideals which are supposed to be a finite co-length that you blow them both up, and then you, that would give you two divisors of the type you want, and then you could try to say, yeah, any, any, any solution of this kind will be satisfactory. So at the moment, there is no solution in no terms. And so we have only partial. I, I want to give partial answers today to this problem. And you, you will see in which way we formulate them. OK, so now, now I want to relate this problem to the uh, classical adjacency problem of singularities. So classification of singularities and classical adjacencies, this is com completely related. OK, so and now, so there was, uh, so the idea comes from Monique Leyen. Uh, so the, the origin of the idea is Monique Leyen way of So she had the idea of studying this problem in the following way. So. So she, she said the following. Let's suppose that Karp's selection lemma is true for arc spaces. OK? So I make a picture. Suppose that this is the arc space, and suppose that this is nf. So this line represents nf. And this suppose that this line represents nei. OK? And suppose that 
and uh, nf is contained in ne so then you pick up an arc gamma belonging to nf and you know that in analytic geometry and in algebraic geometry you have a curve selection lemma so then there exists a, so I, now i apply the curve selection lemma and there exists a path there, is, there, there exists a path alpha that goes from c comma zero. Well, as it, infin, as it is infinite dimensional. I, I won't ask you to trust in convergence to n e such that alpha of the special point equals this point gamma, and alpha of the generic point. Is belongs to n, um, yeah, uh, n e minus n. So this is the typical situation of curve selection lemma. The, the main problem is that curve selection lemma is false in infinite dimensions, but uh, there is a way out. So with uh, some effort, with some effort, and. It's very easy to, to know why curve selection lemma is false in infinite dimensions. So I put the following system of equations. I put x1 equals uh, xn to the power n. I put this system of polynomial equations, and I let n belongs to the natural number. So this is a one-dimensional analytic subset in an infinite dimensional space. And if you try to parameterize it, you can't. Because you cannot extract roots of arbitrary large degree. So this is one reason why once you go in infinitely many variables, proving curve selection lemma is not easy. But in arc spaces, these sets have a very nice property. The sets N E are finite codimensional in the arc space, and uh, uh, under these conditions, uh, Anna Reguera so she provides curve selection lemma. Mm -hmm for arc spaces. So this is in a paper in Compositio. OK. So that, that is not very, it's a not very usable result as it is, because instead of writing a C here, you have to write a K. And K is a huge field. K, K is a field which is of infinite transcendence degree over the complex numbers. So after this, you need to make a specialization procedure. Which is due to Reguera and uh, Jalabert. Uh, again. Gerabert, simultaneously myself. So by some specialization procedure, um, you can forget about this field and write the base field here at the expense of possibly moving this point to another one. But this is not very important because at the end you want a path and you don't mind that the point you choose. And uh, Mm, an application of Popescu approximation, which is due to myself, at the end produces the following. If nf is contained 
in Ni, then there exists convergent power series So even if I am taking C2 here, I am formulating this in the, in, the, in the normal surface singularity case because if I would write C2 here, uh, you don't need actually Popescu approximation. You can do it in, in a simpler way. But finally, if you have NF in an E, you, you can produce such a power series. Let me give variables uh, T comma S here and now I claim that alpha zero of t which is by definition alpha comma t is an arc so alpha zero so if I define alpha s comma t then alpha zero is an arc that belongs to nf alpha s is an arc that belongs to ne for s different from zero and if I make the lifting of alpha zero, it goes transverse through F, and the lifting of alpha S goes transverse through E. Okay. Okay. So this is a, this is an interpretation of this containment, but now this containment is in terms of a family of arts. Okay. I am taking a long time in the introduction, but no, I, I think. Okay, but now let's see what is the meaning the meaning when I take uh, x equals c2, so I take x equals c2, and now, so here I have c2, and now I have two divisors, e and f, divisors over c2. So let me make a sequence of flowing ups of c2 where e and f appear. So, and then now I assume that Ne is in Nf, and I get my family alpha as there, okay? And then what I get, alpha is a mapping from, so I get a family of parametrizations such that alpha zero parametrizes a curve whose embedded resolution goes here, and alpha s parametrizes a curve whose embedded resolution goes through E. Okay? So this means that when I have a containment relation, I have a classical adjacency between the mu class of alpha zero, because the equisingularity class of alpha zero, and the equisingularity class of alpha s. Okay? So let me remind what are the classical adjacency problem. So, so are not classified uh, Singularities up to certain Milner number, uh, you get R not classification, classification in new classes. So essentially, one way of saying it is that uh, F is equivalent, is mu equivalent uh, uh, to. Uh, to G, if and only if, you can put uh, F and G are members of 
the same mu constant deformation. And if you think of curves, I am thinking of curves. So this is equivalent to say that uh, uh, the pair C2 B of F have the same topological type that the pair C2 B of G. So in the curve case, this is completely equivalent. So you can make this equivalent relation in the space of all functions, uh, all function germs from C2 to C. And now you say that one, one uh, Arnold class is equivalent to the other one, if and only if there exists a deformation. So, uh, so I take an Arnold class and I say that uh, um, there is definition, there is yes and C from G to F if there is a family HS family of holomorphic functions depending on a holomorphic and a parameter S such that H0 belongs to F and HS belongs to G for S different from C. So this means that one singularity class is at the limit of the other. Okay? And now if you want to um, if you if you want to encode in some way a singularity class, you can do it uh, uh, using the topological type, and the topological type is equivalent to the resolution graph. So you can take the minimal. Embedded resolution of a germ and then you make a, the associated dual graph putting arrows where the uh, strict transform meet. Okay? So you get a graph and, and now you, you these two Two, two curves belong to the same class if the embedded resolution graph is exactly the same. So this means that the, uh, yeah, uh, the Arnold adjacency problem is a combinatorial problem because you only need to know the graphs uh, in order to check that two functions uh, are adjacent or not. So Arnold adjacency is a combinatorial problem. Okay. Okay. Now, if I give a divisor E, given E, I can do the following thing. I can take the minimal model, the minimal sequence of flowing ups of C2, where E appears. I take the strict transform, uh, I take a curve which is transverse through E. And then I get a curve here. Take any equation, let me call this HE. There is a little ambiguity, which is multiplied by a unit, but I, I, have an, I can have an equation. So this given E, this E gives rise to an Arnold adjacency class. And now if I have that NE contains NF, because I have that parametrization in family, then I have that H E, that there is adjacency. There is an adjacency from H E, I will write it like this, to H F. Okay, see, if N E contains an F, then I get a classical adjacency. Okay, so let me say Okay, so and this family comes from 
taking the family of parametrizations, alpha s, and now you take an equation for each of the images, images, and then you get a family of functions. Okay. So uh, now I can make a definition. Definition uh, given two divisors e and f uh, e is nas adjacent to f if uh, n e belongs to an f two e is adjacent to f if there exists a family of functions family of function depending on a parameter such that the strict transform If you, if you take the embedded resolution of the special member and you take the strict transform, it meets F in a transversal way. And now if you make the embedded resolution of the generic member and take the strict transform, it might meets the divisor F in a transversal way. So the difference between NAS adjacent and adjacent is that the uh, 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 the family of functions, um, so in, if you take an adjacency, the family of functions need not uh, have a parametrization in family. So this means that uh, um, uh, adjacent okay, NAS adjacent is Adjacent plus uh, adjacent via delta constant deformations. Because if you have a family, uh, if you if you have a family of plane curves, you know that you can parameterize in family if and only if it is delta constant. Okay. Del delta? The delta invariant of a curve. I've forgotten. Milner number divided how by two. Many, how many nodes, how nodes appear? Yeah. How many nodes appear in an arbitrary deformation of the parametrization? Exactly. And in okay. the reducible case, it's the Milner number divided by two. So we'll see time when that means OK. <laughs> uh -huh. OK, so NAS adjacent is adjacent via delta constant deformations. And now I want to say what is the difference between uh, adjacent and Arnold adjacent, OK? So of course, if E is adjacent to F, then so E adjacent to F means that a function H E, which is the equation of, a, so I remind the definition of H E. So I fix E, I take a curve, a curvet, which is transverse, I take it down, and I make an equation. So this means that I have an Arnold adjacency. So suppose I have two curves in the plane. And suppose that I know, so I have two curves, G and and suppose that I, I know that there is a family, Hs, such that the class of H0 is F, and the class of H um, S is G. And suppose that these functions uh, arise as follows.
So I make a sequence of low enoughs in C2, where E and F appear. I make a curvet through F. I make a curvet through E, and I take down. I take them down, and G is the equation of the one through F, through G, and F is the equation of the one through F. So I know they uh, they are Arnold adjacent, but I don't know whether they are they are adjacent through this definition. So the difference is as follows. So when you make the uh, embedded resolution of a plane curve, in the process you have to blow up points. So the blowing up points can appear either at the meeting point of two divisors, or they can appear in the middle of one divisor. So when they are at the meeting point, there is no ambiguity. And when they appear in the middle point of a divisor, this means that there, are, there is moduli in the, in, the, in the Arnold class. So if I would blow up, if I, I can get another curve exact, having exactly the same topological pattern through the same point, uh, through, through a different point of the divisor. Okay, so these kind of deformations, the deformations that appear in this kind of adjacency, are deformations such that the free points in the embedded resolution do not move when you move the parameter. Okay, and so these are deformations. Uh, so now I'll tell the difference. So, just uh, see. Divisors gives Arnold adjacencies through families. HS such that the free points of the embedded resolution of HS is different from zero. Uh, are not moving when we move yes. So the adjacencies of, of divisors are adi usual are not adjacencies, but we call them uh, adjacencies with uh, fixed free points. Because the, fixed, the free points cannot move because at the end you have to end up in the same, in the same divisor. So, so now there are three notions. And uh, yeah, the Arnold adjacency problem is well known to be uh, impossible. So it's, uh, mm, yeah, it's a, one of the big problems is try, try to make a list of, complete list of Arnold adjacencies. And even, even when you get two concrete functions, it is painful to decide if they are adjacent or not. And, but we can give a characterization. We can give a characterization. So, this uh, Arnold adjacency is painful. Problem one is painful also. But this problem, so we discover this problem is easy. So now I am going to give the solution to this problem and to relate them uh, with the others. Easy or at least, well, it has an easy solution. That's the case. So the evaluative criterion. So I am in, in this talk. I am speaking about irreducible curves, deformation be, deformations between irreducible curves. But most of the things that I am saying have a variant for reducible germs, and our paper is written in terms of uh, uh, several branches curves. So, but uh, for for communicating the results, the easiest is to speak about irreducible germs. But it's it's not really necessary. Uh, okay. So the evaluative. Okay. 
so I am being very slow. I thought uh, I have time enough, but it won't, it won't be the case. So I will take the whole hour. Uh, so the evaluative criterion uh, is a, a method that was used to study the, the NAS problem, and it's, it's a very simple thing. Uh, so given a irreducible divisor, so divisor, I can associate the divisorial valuation, U sub E, So it gives a, you give a function, and it gives a number. And this number is the following. So you take a, a model where the divisor appears, and you take a pullback of the model, pullback of the function in the model, and now you, in a, you take a chart, and in this chart you suppose that f is divided, is defined by a coordinate, and now this is, is the component of the total transform, so is how much the total transform of the function is vanishing along this component uh, times something. Okay? So this, this has a very easy descri description. So if I take a curve here, this means that uh, mu e of f, sorry, this is e. Uh, so the evaluation at e is the intersection multiplicity of the, so you take the curve here, and I said before the notation that the, when I take the image, I call the equation of the image h e. So if I take the intersection multiplicity of the curvette through e and my function f, then I get exactly, if I am careful, and I choose uh, this curve generic enough. <laughs> so you, you, if, the, if f meets here, you shouldn't be so stupid to take it here. Okay, but this is an intersection multiplicity. And then it becomes clear that when e is adjacent to f, then the valuation at e is bounded by the valuation at f. Okay? This is completely clear. And a classical way to, of studying Nash question is to do, to apply this to one. So I, I showed that this happens for two, but well, what people was doing is to, to do one implies, uh, uh, one implies the evaluative inequality, and this was more or less enough to prove some of the, well, the, some, the easier cases of NAS question for surfaces could be solved like this. So now we have the following theorem. Theorem. Uh, e is adjacent to f, if and only if, uh, uh, new e is bounded by new f. So this is a characterization. So we found out that so people was not able to solve last question only using the evaluative criterion because actually what it, uh, the evaluative criterion exactly misses the delta constant condition. So this is one of our theorems, and the proof is surprisingly simple. I am not making it by lack of time, but it's su surprisingly simple. So it's just um, intersection multiplicity computations. Okay. Yeah, so this is one of the results. And the results, the other result is, uh, okay, so after all, how easy? How easy is to find out whether, uh, whether the, the evaluative inequality is satisfied or not. So you have to check in infinitely many functions so it can be long. Uh, so, uh, theorem. Um, let pi from C to 
from x tilde to c2 be a model where p appears. Okay, so this theorem, I, I am going to state this theorem in the general form. Um, so I say let f be a prime divisor. So this means that I let e to make to be a sum of a i e i with e i prime divisor. Okay. And now uh, the following are equivalent. Uh -huh. A is mu f is as well equal to the sum of a i mu i. Okay. And now B. Uh -huh. Let um, uh -huh. you take a model, so I need a bit more notation. I take pi minus 1 of 0, and I decompose it as a union. I make the irreducible component decomposition. OK. And now, for each of these components, I pick up a curvet, OK? So this, let me call the curve. Um, OK, I pick up a curvet. And each of them, I push it down to C2. And I take a def defining equation that I call H, HDI, OK? So I get finitely many functions. I get finitely many functions. And, and now it's f of h d i h d i. Okay. So this means that I can check the evaluative criterion, infinitely many functions, and it only depends on the uh, to find them. Only depends on the resolution of uh, of the of the general term. So it's really easy. It's really easy to compute. Uh, whether this criterion is satisfied or not. Okay, so moreover, if uh, E is irreducible, so this means that uh, E equals D1, for only one D1, then everyone knows that the minimal model in which D appears is of this shape. So the, the, the dual graph have this shape. And the number of legs that you find here is the number of push pairs. Then I can reduce more the number of uh, testing curves. And instead of taking all the divisors, I can take only the ending points of the legs and the raptor, rupture vertices. And I think I don't know. Only, only the two first legs are needed. So this, the rest are not needed. So you, you need exactly g plus 2 testing curves uh, in order to make the computation. So it becomes really easy. So this is, uh, that part is proved using Navjankar approximate roots. Okay, so this, uh, okay, so now if you apply, so then what we did is to, to make some 
zoology of singularities. So we took Arnold adjacency list, and since this was easy, we started checking out which Arnold adjacencies are uh, are adjacencies of this kind. And I will make the I will make I will picture the table for the simple singularities, just to to have a to let you have a feeling. And then in the in the overtime five minutes, I will explain uh, whether the problem is combinatorics or not, combinatorial problem or not. Yeah. So this is Arnold adjacency list. Uh -huh. So all arrows which are pictured here, are, OK, I don't write E8. So all the arrows that are pictured here, solid or not, are Arnold adjacencies. But only and solid, solid arrows are adjacencies of divisors. So this means that you can get the adjacencies by the formation of functions that do not move the, fix, the fixed point. So you see that almost all of them are, but some of them not. So for example, you cannot pass from D5 to A4. And also you cannot pass by this composition from E6 to A4. So you can check that from E6 to A4, you cannot pass. And this equation So this gives an Arnold adjacency from E6 to A4. But if you check, there is a free point that is moving in the adjacency. And there is no way of making the adjacencies so that you leave this free point quiet. So nevertheless, so, in the, so we check uh, Arnold list, and it was supplemented by other authors. So in the list of classified singularities, uh, the, there, there appear 93 adjacencies. And out of these 93 adjacencies, only seven of them are not realized uh, in this way. So this is most of them seems to, but it's not. So not all of them. Okay. And now let me. Yeah. Now it's time. So let me speak a couple of more minutes because other, otherwise you will miss the most interesting result. Uh, okay. So a corollary of this. So let me call this theorem. A and this theorem B. So corollary of theorem A is that uh, um, the adjacency between divisor is a, comb a combinatorial problem. So what means being a combinatorial problem? So when you have two divisors, you can make you can make the minimal model where they appear, A and F, OK? So I, you put a curvet here, and you put a curvet here, OK? And now you can make a dual graph. You make the dual graph construction, and get, you get a graph which has several combinatorics, well, several, well, some edges and vertices and two arrows. And each of the edges is weighted by self-intersection. So you get a decorated graph. OK? And now, since, uh, since you have theorem B and, you can, and, and these numbers are actually intersection multiplicities, 
only from the graph information, you can notice if, if the functions are adjacent or not. So a corollary of this theorem is that if you have two pairs of divisors, so I, I have two pairs of divisors, E1, F1, and E2, F2. I make the common graph for this pair, and I make the common graph for this pair. I suppose that these two graphs are the same. Then if there is an adjacency from E1 to F1, then there is an adjacency from E2 to F2. So only knowing the graph, I know whether the adjacency exists. Okay, so now theorem C. Is that Nas adjacency is combinatorial? Okay, and the proof of this theorem is hard. So this, at least for us, uh, so the proof of this theorem involves topology and a theorem of Grauer of lifting, uh, lifting complex structure to covers. And so there are difficulties in proving this theorem. So the, this is a corollary. This is more or less classical singularity theory, just doing intersection multiplicities. The proof of this theorem is uses techniques which are not classical. It's completely new and it's a shame that I didn't save time to, to say a word on, on it. So let, let me stop here. Are there questions? <laughs> I have one. So this works by, you, start, you, start, uh, you have two functions you want to check and you get a better resolution of both of them? No, actually, uh, well, now since you ask, I can say a word. <laughs> so let me say a word. So. So this, this works as, as follows. It's kind of scary that you're clearing off a board and a half. <laughs> okay, so what? This is Nash adjacency, so. Uh, well, somehow I provoke these questions. I'm, Happy that uh, I got it. <laughs> so so I, I, I get two divisors which are, are combinatorially equivalent. So this means that their common resolutions have the same structure. So let me make the common resolution of one of them. I picture it here. And so this is E, this is F. Okay, and now this is a modification of C2. And since these two are Nash equivalents, I have a map from C2 to C2 that such that this arc is sent to um, this arc, which is uh, this is alpha zero, has a lifting through F1 and this arc transforms in alpha s that has a lifting through here. And now, OK, and now I have another picture which is combinatorially exactly the same. I want to produce a mapping from C2 to C2, but such that the lifting of alpha 0 comes here, and the lifting of alpha s comes here. But the main problem is that there could be a lot of free points in this resolution process, and they, they could, could, be, could move. So I play the following dirty trick. <laughs> so I, I, do, I, do a resol I, I try to lift to here, so I can't, so I blow up. I blow up, and now I have a mapping from here. And now this mapping is not neither proper nor finite. But I will pretend that it is proper and finite. 
And the way of pretending it is the following. So uh, you suppose that this, uh, this mapping is algebraic, and then you view this piece of C2 as a charm of something larger. So you complete the curves that, that collapse, you complete them to projective ones. You can achieve this by using some approximation theorem. And, and then I do um, a Stein factorization, and instead of getting C2, I get a singular germ, OK, which maps from C2. And this C2 is just a chart in the resolution of singularities of this singular germ. But to skip this complexity, just think that this is proper. And by a Stein factorization, you will collapse all the curves that come to a one point. So just pretend that th this mapping is proper plus fine. So this is a matter of making the picture a bit more complicated and doing a Stein factorization. OK, if, if it is proper and fine, now, now I, do, I look for the ramification. So I will have some ramification here. And now I am making homeomorphies from here to here. And the homeomorphies is going to send, OK, so these are combinatorial equivalent. So I, I, there exists the homeomorphies that send, uh, oh, so this is E. Uh, this is E1, and this is F1. This is E2, and this is F2. So I can find a homeomorphies by pieces. So I say this box is homeomorphic to this box. So each time I find a piece of the ramification that is not in the exceptional divisor, I, I make a, a analytic isomorphism between this box and this box. And this I do by pieces. And then I extend in a dirty way to a homeomorphism. And I know I, I can't because the, combinatoric, the combinatorics is the same. So I don't, I'm in a completely uncareful way. And now I make the composition from here to here. OK? So this, is, this mapping is not any more analytic. This mapping is not any more analytic, but it is finite. It's, it's a branch cover, topologically. And this has an analytic structure. Well, I am actually from here, because from C2 is impossible. So this mapping is uh, a branch cover. Here there is an analytic structure and the branching locus, I did the homeomorph homeomorphism in a careful way so that the branching locus is analytic. Because notice that when the, there was a component in the branching locus, I said, take this box analytic. And when you have an analytic cover with analytic branching locus, a theorem of Grauert says that there exists a pullback of the complex structure. So I take the I erase the complex structure I had here, and I put a new one. But now, the exceptional components have exactly the same number of minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. So I, cannot collab I can collapse them, because this, this collapsing is completely combinatorial. So when I collapse all the possible curves, I will get to a C2. And this mapping from C2 to C2 magically gives a new family realizing the other adjacency. So this is a, a, this trick of, a, so it's a dirty topological trick, and it, but it works. So when I was, when we were down in San Carlos, I went to a talk by someone who was talking about uh, adjacent singularities and how much the Milner number could jump. I don't know if you went to that talk. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I forget who it was by a woman. Polish, uh, Polish. Uh, I forget her name. Yeah. Does this tell you anything about which mil? You know, you fix a, you fix one of your mu classes. Oh, this you is. You fix one of your mu classes. Can you say? This is you know, which Milner numbers are. So we we didn't explore, but now with this, if we if we use the intermediate concept of adjacency, yeah. we should because it's, it is so simple. We should be able to. To, to explore in the list uh, and used, see what happens. Uh, Newton polygons, right. I yeah. think. I don't know. But we didn't address this question with the new concept of ad the intermediate concept of adjacency, which is uh, not so natural but handy. And 
Are there other questions, comments? All right, well, let's thank Javier again. Thank you. Thank you.